In today's episode, I'd like to take a look at my IKEA Bekant adjustable table. So while I sometimes really enjoy the work in a standing position, it's pretty nice to have a table like this. There are two buttons on the side where you are able to simply move it up and down. The main part that I'm missing here is some sort of memory function like you might know from a car seat. There you have like three different positions that it will memorize. So I'd like to take a closer look at the electronics involved and see if we could attach some microcontroller to bring in that memory functionality. Once we figure out how it works, we'll design a new button housing with two additional memory buttons that can also hold a little custom board. We'll print that with the 3D printer and reattach it to the table. With that all said, let's get started. First I'd like to take a look inside the button housing. I'm hoping to see a controller that manages the movement of the table. If not, and that seems to make sense, they are just some wires connected to the buttons. If that's the case, we sadly have to disassemble the whole table and keep our fingers crossed to find any controller. Okay, that indeed looks promising. Sadly the main chip has a custom part number. But I've done some online research and found another guy that also disassembled this table. He had a standard PIC microcontroller installed. That's good news. So after getting a rough overview and checking some data sheets, you can see that they've installed a standard 3.3V buck converter and some circuitry that seem to be for bus driving and level shifting from 12 to 3.3V. The next thing is to bring this board to our working bench. After soldering in some wires to hook up the adjustable power supply, we can start poking around with the oscilloscope. Even if my power supply only goes up to 15V, it still should be enough for the buck converter to output 3.3V. Just by looking at the signal, we can tell that this is no regular UART. In addition to that, it seems that the blue wire is the only one transporting data, so this has to be some sort of one-wire protocol. I still think it's able to send and receive, since it probably needs to get positioning feedback from the motors. My oscilloscope is very limited at serial decoding, so we have to come up with another plan. After reconnecting the board to the table, there might be another chance before we really dig into the protocol. As the original designers need a way to debug their board, it might be a serial output somewhere. I've soldered in some access pins and hooked them up to the analyzer, but had no success whatsoever. Back to the original thought, I'm just doing a 5 second data capture of the unknown bus to get a rough overview. It seems like this board or some other component attached to the bus sends a bulk of 10 packages every 45 milliseconds. I have absolutely no idea what that protocol is, but unfortunately there's a guy online who already figured out that this might be the LIN protocol. LIN stands for Locally Interconnected Network. I don't want to go into the details too much, but it works after a very simple principle. There's only one master and one or many slave devices attached to the bus. The master sends a header frame to which a slave can respond with some data. Mostly important is that every header frame consists of an identifier. That's how a particular slave device figures out if it is responsible for answering that request. They then simply append that packet with their data here. All we have to do now is to figure out if there is a certain node that sends a table position. With that information a microcontroller can simulate either a button up or a button down press to move the table until it reaches our desired position. To get a better overview it's helpful to look at this kind of data through a spreadsheet. I've captured and exported some more packets while the table is idling, going up and going down. As we can see, there are many packets that only consist of the header information without any response. This might be for different models and not used by the electronics in my desk, therefore we can simply ignore them. The only ones left might be the ones we are looking for. By comparing all spreadsheets, it seemed that ID18 is sending a 2 byte position. If I drive the table up, this value increases. If the table goes down, it decreases. Perfect. Let's write some code, hook up the microcontroller and see if we can use this. To make use of the built-in level shifting circuitry, I've soldered in an access pin. However, there's one odd problem. For whatever reason, they've inverted the 3.3V signal. To still make use of that pin, we'll wire up a simple circuit that inverts this signal back. I chose a very common 2N3904 NPM transistor. With the pull-up resistor connected in series to the collector pin and the current limiting resistor at the base, we have a simple logic level inverter. By applying a logically high signal at the input pin, the transistor will switch on. This will obviously result in a very low resistance between the collector and emitter. 
Therefore, the entire operating voltage will drop at the pull-up resistor, leaving the output signal at 0 volts or logically low. By turning off the input signal, the transistor will switch off and result in a very high collector resistance. Now almost the entire voltage will drop at the collector emitter side and therefore result in a logically high output pin. I made a quick prototype and hooked it up to the oscilloscope and a signal generator. The input in blue and the output in yellow show that this circuit is working properly. Though this setup has its limitations, you can only use this at fairly low frequencies. The rise and fall time of the output signal will make the digital signal shift in time. This may end up not being compliant to your bus specifications. In our scenario though, the fastest signal is switching at about 10 kHz and that's totally fine. So let's finally attach our controller to that circuit and write some code. For this project I'm using an Arduino Nano clone from Banggood. It features an Atmega 328P, which is more than sufficient for our purpose. We'll use the built-in UART for debugging and a software serial connection for the LinBus stuff. To begin, I first searched for a Lin library that already exists. There are a couple of libraries out there, but I chose the one from Scepter. He made a little gadget that can monitor and inject Lin frames. It also uses the same microcontroller and therefore I was assuming that there will be no code involved that might be unsupported. Thanks Scepter for saving us a lot of time. So first I boiled down the library by stripping out unnecessary parts. The bus in our system seems to be a bit off the specification. Therefore I had to make a couple of slight modifications to the library. In the setup call we just need to start a serial connection for debugging and some calls for initializing the lint stuff. The library uses interrupts so we have to enable them here as well. The interesting stuff happens in the loop function. If a new frame comes in, we'll grab the first byte, which is the address, and check whether this is a packet with the table position. If that is one of these, we simply have to grab the next two bytes and apply some bit shifting to get the final numeric value. To test that, we just print that to our console. Let's give it a try. By hitting Command Option B to compile and Command Option U to upload, the compiler output gets sent to our microcontroller. After opening the serial monitor at a baud rate of 115 to 100, we sure enough see some arbitrary value that represents our table position. When we now move our table up or down, this will in or decrease. So what's next? We might want to see the actual height, not just the arbitrary value. To do so I move the table to its bottommost position at a height of 65 centimeters. That corresponds to a value of roughly 162. The highest position at 1.25 meters is about 6200. Both numbers, the actual height and its corresponding value are not parallel to each other. With some mathematics we could design a function to get a height for a value. But we actually do not need that. We don't want to tell the table to move at the height of 1.3 meters. We want it to go to a predefined position. So remember what we are up to. We still want those simple up and down movement buttons. But in addition to that we also want two memory buttons that will memorize one position each. One for standing and one for sitting at the table. Before we continue adding functionality, we first have to remove the flat flex connector of the PCB. Because we don't need that anymore, I chose to use a hot air gun to heat up all the pins at the same time. You usually don't want to use a hot air gun because it will destroy that connector entirely. With that removed, we now need a way to attach these little pins to our custom board. By using the holes in the PCB as a strain relief, I attach two very fine gauge wires to both the button up and button down pin. As I know, they are pulled up by resistors and shorted to ground once a button gets pressed. All we have to do now is connect those wires to an output pin of our microcontroller and turn them low to simulate a button press. To make things a bit easier, I've also added a screw terminal, secured the fine wires with hot glue and soldered in two additional terminals. One for the LIN signal and one for the blue wire that connects two of the motors. Off camera I've also built a little board that holds four buttons and two LEDs. The buttons are equipped with pull down resistors and will turn high as soon as they get pressed. The LEDs will light up as soon as the microcontroller simulates a button press in either direction, so we can visually see that. With that hooked up, we can now switch back to our code. I already finished the code off camera, so we can now go through the most important parts. Since this is not an Arduino tutorial, I won't go into every single detail. But this code will be available on GitHub, so if you are interested, check out the link in the video description. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments. Well, so let's start with the setup function. 
we still have that serial.begin and some initial console output. Then we initialize two table controlling pins. Remember, we need to pull one of them low to start moving the table up or down. That's why we make them an output and later set that to low if we want the motor to start running. Then we have our buttons. These are of course regular input pins with the pull-down resistor. By initially turning the motors off and enabling the lint stuff, the setup of the pins is completed. Now something new. Since we want to store our memory positions in a non-volatile memory, we'll simply use the built-in EEPROM functionality. Note that by default, the values in an EEPROM are not 0, but 1. So if you for example erase the entire content of an EEPROM, everything will be written as logically high. So if the values got from the EEPROM are at the highest possible value, we assume that the EEPROM content was never used and initialize it to something more appropriate. Now that finishes our setup. Let's move over to the loop function. I'd have to explain how this movement process works in general. It has a current position and a current target value. In every loop cycle it compares these two values and determines if the table has to move to reach a target. This will result in a direction value that indicates if the table has to go up, down or stay at its current position. The move table method will set the appropriate pin to start or stop the movement. So if we want to let's say move the table to a stored position, we simply set the current target to that specific value and the table will start moving. Next we pause our buttons. Let's take a closer look at the read buttons function. There we check if a button is high and therefore being pressed. For debugging and logging a simple serial output is being sent only once per button press. If a button has been pressed we'll store that and return the function. If no button was pressed the press button variable will be zero. After parsing the buttons the loop buttons function is called. Here we take action if any button was pressed. So if we hit the move up button, the current target is set to the last position plus some target threshold. Now the threshold is important because the table accelerates and decelerates when it starts or stops moving. If we release the up button, it keeps going for a couple of centimeters to smoothly stop instead of hitting the brakes too hard. If we simply check whether the current position matches the target, the table will overshoot that value. This will result in a downward movement after it has stopped because the target is lower than the actual table. That's how the up and down buttons work. But if we hit the memory button instead, we want two different behaviors. First, a short button press will move the table to that specific position. But when we press the button for a longer period, the current position gets stored. So to achieve that, we get a current millisecond timestamp. And once the button is released, we are comparing it with a newer timestamp to get the duration. If that is lower than a second, we just set the current target to the position stored, but if it is a longer press, we don't move but store the position into the EEPROM. But now, finally, it's enough with the theory. Let's see this stuff in action. Now that's so much better than before. To finish this project, we'll still have to do two things. First, the current assembly gets power from the USB cable. That of course will not be connected after this is finished. As a power supply, I've covered a small buck converter with some heat shrinking tube and attached the input to the 24 volt rail and the trimmed 5 volt output to the power of the board. Then we still need a proper enclosure to put our electronics in. That will then be attached right there where the old one was. Since this video is already pretty long, I'll design a new enclosure in the next episode. I really hope you had a good time watching this. If you did, I'd be glad to see you next time.